everybody to our speaker series and this speaker series we're so happy to have Michael Follin and he will speak on the right drivers for whole system success integrating learning and well-being. We welcome the St. Clair Catholic District School Board community members from parents to teachers to admin to EAs, sports staff and also all the members from the Ontario Healthy Schools Coalition, which is very, very diverse. Next. Switch side. Thanks. So we are going to do a land acknowledgement first for the St. Clair Catholic District School Board acknowledgement of our ancestral lands. We are thankful for the Creator's gift of Mother Earth providing everything we need for life, air, water, land, and all of creation. We acknowledge that this land surrounded by water on which we are gathered today is part of the ancestral land of the Anishinaabeg and the Luna Piwak. Together as treaty people, we have a shared responsibility to act with respect for the environment, protecting the future for those generations to come. Next, so while we say this prayer, please keep in mind the survivors and also the victims of the residential schools that we have just learned about. So join me in saying this prayer. In the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Father, thank you for the strategic drivers you have orchestrated for creative collaboration. Bless each of us with a continuous flow of innovative creativity as we work harmoniously together in constructing a pathway for success. Bless each of us to appreciate each other, listen to our voices without judgment, and be visionary for the future of public education. Allow us to leverage our weaknesses and strength for optimum success. Bless us to go beyond our comfort zone, to allow humans to be vulnerable in this process in order to cul cultivate safe, creative environments for everyone, especially for those who are suffering. Father, most of all, watch over all of us as we work together. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. And next. So my name is Christine Priest. I am the mental health and well-being lead for the St. Clair Catholic District School Board. I'm also a proud member of the Ontario Healthy Schools Coalition. We partner together to bring Michael Follin. We're so excited to have Michael. Michael has recently just written a paper, a document on talking about the importance of integrating well-being in everything we do in education. Michael is a worldwide authority on educational reform with a mandate of helping to achieve the moral purpose of all children learning. He's the former Dean of the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. Michael advises policymakers and local leaders around the world to provide leadership in education. He's the co-director of new pedagogies for deeper learning. What I learned from Michael is for those people that are on the line and with Ontario Healthy Schools is that Andy Anderson was one of our founding and we had a proud membership with him and he was a real leader in the Ontario Healthy Schools and Michael told me he hired Andy at OISE so he has a deep relationship with him. So what we're going to do is Michael is going to give his presentation and if you have questions we asked you to go to the Google form that was sent in your email for this presentation and post your questions within that. After Michael is finished speaking, I will facilitate those questions. Welcome, Michael. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, uh, this is great to be with you and I, I want to put this in context uh, because uh, we are, our group has a lot of connections with the Ontario Health Schools Coalition and other groups across the country. So I, this is just a uh, 
slice, slice of us, I guess I'll say, that relates to your agenda and ours. And to put it in perspective in two ways, first, uh, who we are, and the second, our modus operandi. Uh, the who is about, it's about eight of us. Uh, you will know, some of you will know them, and some of you will know all of them, perhaps. Uh, but Joanne Quinn is my uh, co-director of Deep Learning, a uh, former superintendent in um, Halton. And uh, we worked together for a long time. Uh, Meg Gardner's from Hamilton is our capacity builder uh, that doing, in a sense, half the world of our deep learning. Uh, Max Drummy is another one who based in Australia, do, does uh, the other side of the world, so to speak. Uh, Bill Hogarth is uh, also a big uh, member of us. Uh, Gene Clinton, you will definitely know, who is re increasingly part and parcel of our of our team and uh, and really crucial for that. And Bailey, uh, my uh, son is also dealing technology. So we have about eight people where we're mixing and matching. We're working in 12 different countries, so it's massive. So you're just getting a, a, a piece of it. Uh, the, the, the part about the modus operandi, I think two things should be said. One is our devotion to practice that 80% of our best ideas come from leading practitioners. This is why all of our work, and I do mean all of it, 100% of it, is done in partnership with uh, chunks of the school system in different countries, including the mental health side, where we're, whenever we do something, it's jointly determined, it's uh, jointly developed, we publish a lot together, all of those things. So this is really very much uh, that commitment to, uh, to that uh, mutual development and the second part of this as distinctive for us, I think, is we have come, although we have come from learning and pedagogy originally, we now fuse is the best word. We fuse well-being and learning. It's the same thing. We don't we don't just do learning and say, oh, we better have social emotional learning. Let's parachute that in. It's all part of, uh, as you'll see, I'll give a bit of a slice of that. So think of that as a frame. Uh, we also, because of the nature of this work, and because it's jointly determined and devoted to practice, it means you really have to be uh, in the in the agenda every day. You have to solve problems every day. You have to grow and develop it. So that's the flow I'll take in the next uh, 40 minutes, and then we can go and really deep questions. I hope you will feel free to respond to any of our deep learning team uh, uh, because we are really well plugged in a lot. We're working with a lot of districts, for example, in Ontario. So. Uh, let me uh, start in an odd way. I'm going to say. I just I was re doing reading some tweets the other day, and uh, I just want to use this as a point of departure. So the tweet said, uh, as it says here, 43% behind in reading, 54% in math. Uh, Miami Dade is a very big district in Florida, huge. Uh, I don't know, 400 schools, whatever. So the first thing to say is. Uh, this is the wrong starting point. It, it was always the wrong starting point, but it's definitely coming back from the pandemic, uh, which you would not do, and I'm not going to dwell on this other than to say, what you would not do is start to say, how do we immediately get these kids to, let's get the worksheets out, get, let's get them to catch up and doing um, doing from there. So what, uh, I'll give you a flavor of our thinking. Uh, it'll be close to yours, very close to yours. Uh, we will take, and I'll give you a couple of uh, short papers that reference to it that we've already done about this transition from the pandemic. Uh, but you see in this slide, I won't read all the words, that we, where we're going to start in any given case is not how much have you lost in literacy or math or anything like that, but what, how are you? What have you been doing? What's uh, what's important to you? Uh, and I hope uh, one, of, one of my other sons who actually doesn't work with us closely yet, uh, Josh uh, Fullen, I uh, just did an interesting uh, article last weekend in the Globe on Let Them Play, it was called. And so it is really a great kind of emotional uh, tied into the uh, the conditions of motivation. So it's really is about um, about the well-being, but it's very close to learning. Uh, if we think about a, uh, where we these, this is what we prioritize in our own work, that we really are uh, figuring out where people, not where people should be, but where they are and how to how to get from there in developing uh, it using the methods of well-being and learning uh, rather than uh, uh, learning. We, we, we like to call it learning rather than this is schooling. And you'll see how we merge the two so that they're, I'm going to say that they're seamless, uh, that uh, being non-judgmental about it, really getting into the motivation, getting the activity going, all of those is essential. 
Uh, I know, and also because of your group, I was uh, uh, on this deck. I just actually you don't have this slide because I didn't send it in advance. I just made it up uh, uh, this morning. Uh, but uh, in talking with Mag uh, Gardner, who does our, our work with us, it's very clear here that all the time, not just the, the pandemic, when we think about doing something in um, in any given jurisdiction, and we're in a lot of the, uh, it's very well developed in the Ottawa Catholic District, our deep learning. We've got great things going on in Newfoundland Labrador. I'm going to show you a video from there. Uh, several other uh, districts around, but it really is the, uh, when we think of the well-being agenda, and this, there's certainly the coalition is very much in that we want to merge the learning and the coalition agenda into a single concept. And I cut, I gave this the label, I think it's good, invitational, all hands on deck. So when we think of handling the well-being, while it might be led by educators at the beginning because the students are relating to educators, it's immediately uh, all encompassing for, for us as it is for you. It is, uh, it is the, you know, the social workers and the psychologists and others, but it's the parents and the custodians and all of that. And the bottom line in this, um, this slide you see, pay attention to well-being as, as an in inclusive enterprise. It's all the people inside and outside the school that are related to uh, children uh, uh, learning and being uh, well that are uh, not just uh, doing things independently, but more and more they're doing things in an integrated fashion. So that's uh, one part. We won't have time to go through a lot of the details, so I hope you will take advantage of, uh, we like to write in a clear, practical, uh, a deep way, but a way in which it contributes to the solutions. So you see in this array of uh, of covers from the, some of the things we've done recently. Uh, Chris referred to the right drivers, which I'm going to come to actually near the end. It's a, it's a bigger report that I did on, uh, released it on February 12th about what should be the foundations of the solution. But I'm, I'm really going to deal more with you about the, uh, the micro aspects, the elements of it before I go back at the end of the, uh, towards the end of my presentation about the right drivers report itself. So as we got into, if I look at, if you look at the uh, right hand screen, when we got into initially uh, after a few months, about let's say six months of, uh, of COVID, uh, uh, we teamed up with Microsoft and a couple of others that said, how do we make sense of this, this disruption? Uh, we called it Education Reimagine and we wrote a report that our team did. Uh, and um, it was co-sponsored by UNESCO and others, but we called it Education Reimagined. So you can go to that document that, that says, okay, here's disruption. Disruption provides opportunity as well, well as uh, problems. How do, we, how do we manage that? At the time when we did it, uh, first we thought, well, the transition will be eight months. It's going to be 28 months or whatever it will be. And so, uh, but we did, we, we framed it that way. That was, uh, I think, the right thing to do. And then moving to the left there, the Activate Deep Learning Lift from Loss. We did a, a just recently, um, uh, a month or so ago, another paper that was short, six or seven pages said, okay, here's what we need to do uh, immediately as we're dealing with the present time. Uh, right, the right driver's paper we'll come back to later. And there's one other one that we just did uh, in the last two weeks. Uh, it's this one. Um, uh, sorry, this is the lift from loss. I'm, I'm one, one ahead of myself. Uh, the lift from loss one was uh, the priorities that we thought would have to be uh, addressed. And I'm not going to take each of the 10, but this gives you a very good flavor of it. Uh, you, you can see where the well being and the learning comes uh, merged out of this. Uh, these are our guidelines. Uh, we use these uh, reports to give advice, but also as discussion documents that we get people to. Uh, uh, redo the agenda with us jointly by using these stimulus. We get these ideas from the field. Remember I said 80% of our best ideas come from leading practitioners. We're getting these ideas and interacting with them. Sometimes we're testing our own insights. Other times we're seeing an insight that seems so right on. We encompass it, feed it back and so forth. And uh, in the same vein, um, uh, Meg led this one that we just did, uh, came out about a week ago. Uh, that focuses on secondary schools. Uh, what do we do to engage there? What are the same philosophy, same development? So you get the picture of, uh, of the, where we spend our time, so to speak, how we try to integrate and synthesize and fuse. Uh, it might be a better way of putting it. 
But in th stepping back now, I want to do that for a little bit about this. Uh, this is, in a sense, where we started, uh, Joanne Quinn and I and others, <clears throat> about uh, and Mary Jean Gallagher, who's another actually bit, a wider uh, connection for us, used to be head of the Literacy Numeracy Secretariat uh, in the Ont Ontario Ministry, now works with me on system change. So all of us have said the system was in trouble in 2019 and before, prior to COVID. It should have been, it should have been action then, but now COVID is giving us a real reason, a big reason, a deep reason, a pushy reason. And re the reason was in trouble is, and I can give you, this is all based on practical research, uh, the uh, evidence is there, that traditional schooling is boring as the students move up the grade levels, they get increasingly disconnected, that inequity is widening uh, since 1980 at least, uh, galloping inequality we call it. The world is troubled in two ways. One is physical, the other is social. The physical is climate and, and all the related uh, aspects to that. And the second one is uh, social, I call it trust. If you look at any surveys of trust over the last 40 years, trust has uh, crumbled, I guess I'll say, in most, uh, as, as people view the world, uh, their percentage of <clears throat> thinking of people as trustworthy has gone from about 65% to 35, 30% and is still going down. But what do you do about this? And we think this is where deep learning innovations of the kind I'm talking about have a lot of promise. And this is our uh, our own response to it. We formulated this in 2015, 2016, <clears throat> basically coming out of a lot of good coherence work and capacity building work. Said, uh, what's new? We know that uh, we know that students aren't engaged, but w where should we go from here? And then we began to find kindred spirits. Some schools and some school. Educators are saying, no, it's, it actually isn't working and we need to do something about it. And we had, uh, uh, when we wrote the book Coherence, we started into deep learning. We had the opportunity to develop the ideas, uh, uh, leap ahead to the present, I, I'm going to say what was needed uh, beyond that. So that's what we formulated. And since 2016, we have been co-developing it with schools in 12 countries, sets of schools. And we really have gone practical, gone deep, gone comprehensive. Uh, the purpose of deep learning is, and I'll get to uh, a couple of really substantial things. I'm going to show you a video as well. Uh, but the purpose of deep learning is that uh, is to deepen the, you know, the learning so that it's really about what do students, 100% of the students need to cope and flourish in the complex world that we have, which is increasingly demanding as, as is obvious. So what do you do about that? Educational systems did not help uh, students cope and shape the future, and now they have to. And we now know that um, that this uh, that uh, deep learning and uh, and and well-being are two sides of the same coin. Uh, they're, they're 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 actually inseparable for us. Uh, you can't do one without the other. You shouldn't do one without the other. And so we can talk about that afterwards. Uh, the, uh, this, this slide looks a bit clunky here for some reason. About qual quality learning is uh, learning that sticks with you the rest of your life. That's the best way of defining it. Uh, so you can you can see why that the kind of quality learning that we're seeing in uh, this one uh, video will just be one example of it. Uh, but the substance of it is around um, uh, the following framework. Let me think about how many uh, pieces it has. One. Uh, two, three, about four. So piece number one is, is reimagining the purpose of schooling. So that is producing students who are globally competent and able to thrive and influence the world. So new purpose is, uh, is chunk one. Chunk two is uh, the six C's. And it is about, uh, it is about uh, these are all in our model uh, defined. Uh, there's protocols and rubrics to assess them, to shape how they would be uh, taught, that uh, uh, all of the places, it doesn't mean every, you know, on Monday you start in do six C's, uh, but it is the framework that is being done and you need all six C's eventually. The catalytic ones in some ways are character, citizenship and creativity. Uh, the other three are really important, but they've been around, so to speak, and all six, when you put them together, they really start to make a difference. So when we think about coming back, we think about creating schools now around this, uh, revisiting that, going deeper on the six C's where there's a, where there's a, a new enthusiasm 
and development uh, um, about this. I was uh, we we're working in California quite a lot, and I was on, on Zoom yesterday with one of the uh, uh, heads of uh, the the superintendent of one of the counties. There are 58 counties, and he said he was at a graduation cer ceremony two days before, and the students graduating had a look of I don't know glumness. I don't I forget what word he used, but it definitely wasn't joy. That they, even though they were graduating, there was no kind of life there. And what we're finding in our work is strong life. So then to keep the line, because I just want to give you a, a line of our thinking, uh, I'll tell you this, this uh, the uh, third element, remember purpose, six C's. The third element is going to be the uh, redesign of pedagogy and learning. And this is the framework of it. You can see on the left side, this is way, this is the left side produces boredom. Uh, in, in, at least in 2021. And the deep learning produces uh, new ideas, collectivity, sense of humanity, all of those things. Uh, and, and then we do these through the learning design. <clears throat> Again, these are, although I'm putting them analytically here, they're really basically about, uh, about the elements that we require to shape the learning. And these are four, we think it covers the waterfront. The pedagogy is what you just saw, the act of learning on the part of students and teachers. The learning partnerships start to emerge there, but they include parents, the coalition that you represent. Those kinds of partnerships are relevant to achieve this agenda. The learning environments now are not just the uh, classroom environment, but it's the wider world, the community. And leveraging digital is figuring out in the best role for technology uh, that, uh, that we think should be integrated with the four. So all of these are also have rubrics and tools. We operationalize them. And then the rest of the model can be, uh, the full thing can be presented this way. Uh, we have the new purpose as the foundation. And, and then on that foundation, on that pedestal, is what I've just been describing, the six C's in the center, the four elements of the learning design that support that. And then the infrastructure, uh, the school, uh, school conditions, which have to do with uh, the quality of the collaborative culture in the school. There's quite a lot of good stuff on that that we've helped develop and that we know about. District conditions are what the district does to shape this. Again, Ottawa Catholic is a great example. And in a minute, I'm gonna talk about New Newfoundland and uh, Labrador, but the district conditions are there. And then the system conditions are, uh, are really the third uh, the policy level. And I'm gonna say this is the weakest of the three levels. You, uh, you will know that in Ontario. And we work, and at one time we worked closely with the government in Ontario and did, I think, shape a better set of policies. We help shape the policies in California now, which is quite good. We help shape the policies in Victoria, Australia. Uh, so it remains unfinished business. We can talk about that afterwards, but it's a big part. But this is the model. It's all kind of describable, but it's also all operationalized. So let's um, think about uh, deep learning and transforming practice. Uh, if you uh, read, uh, we have two books on deep learning. One is called Deep Learning, Engage the World, Change the World. And the other one is called Dive into Deep Learning. And they're full of examples as well as the descriptions and the frameworks of what this looks like. This has been co-produced with our with the field. It's not us in the laboratory making this stuff up. It's us co-developing that with them. So these six things, very strong elements of uh, what, what we've been doing and what we see as the agenda for the next while. I call the next while, incidentally, the moonshot. This is the moonshot decade. That is a place that has not been developing very much for not just Ontario, but around the world. And now is the time to take advantage of post pandemic, maybe by the time we get to uh, January, <coughs> but to spend the next three or four years really seriously going deep and keeping at it for the decade, but let's say for three or four years at a time. That's the intention. It is about equity. Deep learning we're finding is good for all students, but it's especially good. It connects very well with students have been disconnected because now there's a different purpose. It's not just doing the worksheet. It's uh, doing something worthwhile. It's understanding the world. It's trying to figure out how I can be uh, make a contribution to it. So a lot of things about equity. Um, Oh, I, I'm sorry about that. I want to now just uh, take you back here to uh, what to uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. Just as uh, uh, we have maybe 500 videos, uh, and I wanted to use this one and think about because the size of the problem and the nature of how they're going about it. 
two years ago, uh, the leaders in uh, Newfoundland education in Labrador came to us and said, uh, we like the deep learning uh, and we, we really want to go full into it. Uh, we've seen enough of it that we know it should be for us. So uh, we spend a fair amount of time at the front end. We call this go slow to go fast, make sure that the, the, the pieces are there and so forth. And so this is in Newfoundland and Labrador is very interesting. There's only one school board or there's two actually small French and then a bigger single uh, school board. The total number of schools is about 255. So it's it's big that way, but it's spread across a small bill, uh, you know, fishing villages and all over the land, you know, the, the topography of Newfoundland and Labrador. And they want but they wanted to uh, go into deep learning. And so we spent a fair amount of time joint determining how to go about it as well as the focus, but it moved fast. And it, it, just as we were getting started, we had our last major meeting in March 2020. And the day after we got off the plane from the St. John's, uh, the, uh, uh, the COVID led to uh, lockdown within a few days. So, but in, when I talked to the director of education and said, uh, so are you still ready to go on uh, given now we've, uh, we're having this major disruption? And he said, it's all the more important. So I, I could give you a chapter in detail, but think of this because this is verified now that 255 schools uh, in regions all through the, uh, the, the province, uh, the central office and the, the, the district and, the, and, and the, the minister and so forth saying, okay, let's, how do we do this? So we co-plan and we've been developing this in a, in a quarter, let's say almost a half of the schools now out of the, um, out of the number of schools that the 250 schools, but it's really everybody. And uh, this is uh, in a fairly short period of time, less than two years, about two years, going from uh, uh, a disconnected system that needed change to one where we needed to mobilize the people in the system, mental health people, G Clint works with us as well, the leadership at the school and the regional and state level, the teacher principals uh, and uh, teaching force and all of those part. And so one of they, uh, all of the people that work with us, they're producing things for themselves and for the community of deep learners around the world, the 12 countries in this case. So I'm gonna show you what they did in one of these. Uh, and I'm going to pause at the end of it and ask you, uh, to write a note to yourself for a couple of minutes after you see the video. Uh, so it's slightly longer than we normally show them. I think it might be six or so minutes and I, we're usually liking to show three or four minutes, but you'll like it. And when you, when you uh, finish this, uh, as I said, I'll say, take, you know, make a note to yourself, what's your gut reaction to what you just saw? So it's typical of the deep learning expressions that people get to when they use this framework and when they're control of being innovative and being meaningful in a human way. This music video, I think we started this honestly, probably within the second, third week of us um, singing because we weren't really sure what was going on with choir for the first bit of the school year and with corona and you know what we we're going to do with our masks and whether we could or sing or could not sing but i knew mr colburn was going to figure it out he was not going to let choir not happen to watch them from the first day of listening to the other sisters version to going down the road of here's the music uh let's take a look and let's see what it sounds like let's try it out and to watch that though uh, all of the students kind of collaborate with me because it's not about any standing up and saying this is what you're doing i don't know what's relevant you know or cool so i have to go to them to to get inspiration so when i say uh, well this is something that i think it's a great idea how about we do this why don't we do that and then they start to get involved and that's when you see um you see students really uh, take ownership of things and it's no longer school it's like this is this is ours it's something that we have mr colburn is an incredible choir director and he's always looking for ways to give us new opportunities and try new things and like this video is just one example of the many things we've done over the past couple years we started out with kind of just an idea of 
most of the songs it's written by in Flanders. It's for the CBC Music Challenge, and you know, it kind of just is almost um, a song that meant home to us. And then it kind of grew into this bigger um, concept of inclusivity and you know, speaking for everybody who lives in Newfoundland, not just us. Um, speaking for the deaf community as well. I've heard a lot of deaf people like online say, like talk about like um, sign language interpretations of like songs, mainly from like hearing people and like they just do like movements and like actions and stuff. And like a lot of it is really, um, it's really like inaccurate and like appropriate. People don't know the difference. So like that's like what other hearing people come to to like learn about like sign language and stuff when it's actually like a language like with like facial expressions and like different like signs for like words and stuff and like a culture that like deaf people like own. At a time in our lives, particularly right now with all that's happening in the world, it's caused a collective awareness on marginalized groups and the importance of providing those groups with the support and the voice that they need. Our involvement with this project provided us with many opportunities. Um, a pivotal piece was our philosophy of nothing about us without us. I could see in our Zoom session um, that was held with the Deaf Choir member Paula, the opening of minds. And in that moment, I bookmarked it in my mind. Um, it was an important moment because to me, it really symbolized change was happening. And awareness is the cornerstone of change. I want to thank Robert for having an open heart and open mind to allow me to be involved with the Holy Heart of Mary Choir. I'm so happy to be involved with them. I want to spread deaf awareness of our beautiful language of ASL and our culture. And if you include deaf people in your project, it's not cultural appropriation. The more things that as a school we can offer these students while they're here, the more things they leave here with and the more opportunities that they can continue to bring to other people. These students then crave more of those experiences because they are authentic. You can't learn them out of a book. It's, it's an inward sense of uh, a deeper understanding of things that are happening around them. And that is something that is, is truly part of the educational process for us. It meant something to the deaf community. Um, every little movement, it mattered. Um, we had to edit it a few times, you know, change what we were doing because we realized it was wrong. Um, and so it was all a learning experience for everybody, including Mr. Colburn. And I, I'm really grateful for it. I have to say it's, it's not something I'll ever forget. By participating in choir here at Holy Heart, I think you're able to find a sense of community, you're able to relate to other people, and you're able to make something beautiful together. As a music teacher, I want to be able to give my students as many experiences as they can as they can have. It feels great that at the end of the day, they're going to walk away from this experience and say, you remember when we were in high school and we made a music video? And you remember when we were, uh, we were doing the video and we actually got to communicate and to collaborate with the deaf community at a time when the deaf the light, you know, lights were being shone on the deaf community, uh, that we were part of that. And it, you know, just it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful experience to witness your students growing and, and enjoying something and then uh, it, it evolving into something that can exceed your, your first ideas. The world has changed. The world is about critical thinking. Can you adapt? to the situation you're presented with without knowing what situation you're going to be encountering. And that is the core competency of deep learning is the critical thinking piece. So thinking bigger, thinking inclusionary, thinking collaboration, it's very important. And there are skills that will take you anywhere, uh, no matter what the situation you encounter when you leave high school. Okay, uh, take just one minute and write a note to yourself. What is your gut reaction to having seen that video? Go ahead.
OK, well, I hope you saw the uh, what I described as the fusion of well-being and uh, and learning in the same act. Uh, what you saw in terms of quality experiences of learning that stick with you the rest of your life and um, and just to how the participation and the nature of learning is very different than when I certainly was in school and very uh, and very much in line with what we're talking about. So I want to end in the last uh, 10 minutes before I turn it back to Chris with uh, some emphasis on the leadership part here. The leadership part is about le about leaders who are I've come to say are nuanced. I wrote a book about it, but I drew it on case examples of leaders. When I looked at strategies out there, most of the strategies looked alike. People have a mission statement, they have a strategic plan, they have capacity building, they all looked alike to me. Uh, but when I looked at what, what the impact was and found cases where it was very successful, it turned out the, the particular actions, the operational actions of those that were successful were very different. And that's what I want to highlight in this part, what's highlighted in the book actually, there's about 10 case studies, but I've given the general uh, conclusions about it. One is about context. Uh, context is, uh, it's been said a long time, for a long time now, context is everything, but it's just sort of a phrase. What it really means is that if you're going to lead, you have to lead with knowledge, involvement, and partnership, and with the essence of the context, context you happen to be in. So that uh, this is why we say leaders have to be uh, apprentices as well as experts. They have to know some good things, but they actually have to learn a lot in the particular context that they're in. So I've just summarized here uh, profound truths, I guess they're not my truths, although I'm, I'm the one that's emphasizing context, that all good learning takes place in context. Seems like an obvious thing to say. So, but context is always changing, sometimes in big ways, pandemic. Uh, but a context changes when uh, you, you leave and take a job somewhere else where several people leave and you have to replace them. These are these changes are always happening when policies happen that are different. So context, it's a given that things change regularly and that every time a context changes, leaders become de-skilled because they're not by definition, they can't be just uh, uh, skilled in the context. So the leaders were especially effective are moving in out of in and out of context because they're changing jobs. They're moving in and out of context because their own context is changing. New policies, people coming and going, new new uh, government, whatever. And so they're learners, and they are learners who are helping to create teams and build teams of other learners. And they're uh, they're actually becoming more uh, uh, more able to influence the situation in dynamic ways. So it's spelled out in the book and some of the other things that I've developed in the training we do on nuance that uh, very much gets at this uh, dynamic concept. And so the uh, the other concept I wanted to um, uh, emphasize is about the uh, right drivers. Uh, then I want to get to uh, some of the uh, ways of looking at that. Here's the main diagram. Uh, the main diagram, and you really need to read the report. It comes alive. It's based on evidence, but it's also uh, to me, it's uh, it, it, it led to the most profound thinking that I've had about system change because I realized in doing it that some of the dominant themes, which are drivers, were not the right drivers. They were either wrong or they were leading us down the wrong path. So on the right hand side of that diagram, you see the four things that I think have caused us to go in the wrong direction. The obsession with academics, getting grades and standardization, and success at all costs, producing what uh, one book called uh, wounded winners, even when they win, and also being unfair to a lot that, that don't get it. Machine intelligence, artificial intelligence, which is dominated, it's got good things, but it's dominated in a thoughtless way. Austerity uh, is a different uh, way of going about economics. I'll come to that on the, when I turn to the left side. Fragmentation, we've had frequently of ad hoc policies or no policies at all. In Ontario, for example, now there is no education policy uh, uh, that I know of. It's ad hoc uh, decisions that even if the decision happens to be right on a given day, it's in a vacuum. You have to have uh, these things. So we've been, uh, I've, I've shaped the report mainly on the solution, uh, which uh, you'll appreciate the first one because it's the foundation one. 
It is really getting well-being and learning integrated, not making sure you take both into account or each into account, but having it as the same phenomenon. And I know that's what you stand for in your group. Uh, making sure that we build up social intelligence, which is uh, which is uh, the collaboration. It's the way in which people learn from each each other. It's the essence of the biology of some aspects of uh, of um, neuroscience that Gene talks about, of how we grow and are attracted to. Uh, it also has this uh, negative side if it goes if it goes the other direction, which is uh, I call the social trust collapsing. And then equality investments. Uh, we don't have time to kind of wander over into that other than I want to uh, uh, recommend to you. There are about five books that have been written on uh, by an economist in the last uh, three or four years. Uh, they're all often being women and they all the books are going in the same direction. They're saying on the austerity side, here is the past uh, 40 years of, uh, of, uh, of GDP going up and the distribution of GDP going disproportionately to the wealthy and uh, less and less to uh, the middle class uh, as well as all classes. And then the gap of inequality goes greater and greater. And it just leading to, uh, it's leading to denouement basically is the best word. It doesn't have any ending that, that could be good. Uh, but these analysis also have said, there's a different way of looking at, at money and that what I call equality investments, uh, you could call it prosperity, but it's basically investing in two things. One is to make sure people have a livelihood that they're able to survive at all. And the second though, more you know, long-term developmental, is to invest in capacity building, uh, uh, such as early learning. We know this, uh, such as deep learning, which is different than uh, the learning that you know, I, though I'm describing. I hope you got the difference. And this leads to not only a better society, but a more prosperous society, a richer society, uh, that the wealth goes up and, uh, and, it, and it goes in a different way. This is going to be a tough slog, uh, in, but this is why I call it the moonshot. The moonshot is to build up the left-hand side here as a set of drivers that will change society. We have many countries actually that are interested in this. The politics are fierce when you get that up at the uh, big leadership level. I think a lot of the solutions have to come from the bottom or the middle, and this is why we work there a lot of this. Uh, and it, it is about uh, creating a sense of systemness where people that are in that and the young people today, and I wish I had more time to, to talk about uh, the fact that uh, we haven't found a student young enough who doesn't want to be a change agent, that students have an instinct about uh, what, what, what's wrong. They have a desire to be uh, doing something that's worthwhile. And they, have, they really do have a sense of systemness, not just my own corner here, they're saying there's something bigger here. So if you add those four things as a synergistic strategy on the left, if you uh, if you then uh, begin to dampen the things on the right a, a little bit so that they're not so uh, powerfully wrong, you start to get, I think, a very different equation. Finally, let me just say a couple of things. Uh, we I use the term not collaboration much anymore. I use the term connected autonomy because we need individuals but we need into, autonomy is good, isolation is bad. We need autonomy, be, people with good ideas. We need autonomy to connect to others, contribute and learn from others. Key leadership finding, leaders who participate as learners with staff. Uh, key principle, connected autonomy, a, a, a concept better than collaboration. And then um, a couple of things in closing. When we think about coming back to, uh, again, I'm flipping all the way back to the beginning of this presentation. I call this slide uh, return engagement and I took our findings and the findings that uh, my son Josh is fi finding in his interviews with students across the country. And if you take engagement, it's hard to cal calculate this, but I want to highlight these five points in uh, in closing. Uh, the, the five points are uh, probably at the, uh, during this period of the, of the 14, 15 months, uh, that the that there is a significant level of disengagement of students, probably as high as 30%, in some cases larger, uh, it's, but it's not a huma, homogeneous group. Uh, the ones that are totally disengaged, they didn't like schooling in the first place, they don't like life now, uh, That's a, that they're very hard even to track because they're so disengaged. Uh, but here's a, the third one I think is a great uh, insight that don't assume that just because students are disengaged from school means they're disengaged from purpose. 
there are many kids finding purpose and meaning away from school. The big question is going to how to attract them to learning that's organized in the in the learning system. And then we're finding many students uh, more and more, and this is the this is the optimistic part. They have higher levels. I'm talking about measurement now. Higher le higher levels of citizenship, empathy, and social purpose. Uh, Andy Hargraves is publishing a book in a couple of weeks called The Five Pathways to Engagement. It's about this kind of thing. And then we see an opportunity for creating a, a force for students as uh, you know as part of this uh, development. So let me um, um, stop here by just getting to the end. Uh, I'm stopping more or less in time. I'm gonna we're going to flip off this presentation. I turn it back over to Chris and we have about 15 minutes. Ask me questions, uh, make observations. Uh, let's close with it. This is only like a quick one shot and visit, obviously, but it represents a lot of work that you are doing and that our team is doing as well. Let's connect them and make it go even further. So Chris, over to you. Thank you so much, Michael. That was a wonderful presentation. I have people texting me, telling me that you need to be the next director or the next minister of education. So uh, food for thought there. You're, you're not going to run for politics anytime soon, are you? No, I'm not. <laughs> but you're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much. So I am going to go into the questions. So question number one, how would you engage parents in student learning? We know that parents who are disengaged from the school system have a direct impact on their children's learning. OK, uh, well, we, in our deep learning work, we, we are finding that. Um, I mean, there's a lot of different situations for parents, so I don't want to be superficial about this, but this finding I do know that when we change the learning the way you saw in that video or uh, other videos that we have where students are engaged and they're learning and they're doing things that they never did before and that uh, their their peers and their and the teachers and others are saying I never thought this child would be so engaged I thought that, that they would never would never be able to reach them when they see that degree of success when the when the parents start to pick that up they start to show more interest in the in the schooling and it's their students who cause that interest. It is the teachers and the learning that causes the students to be interested, who in turn interest their parents. So I think that the biggest route is in that uh, in that equation. The second thing, and you, I'm sure you know this, that the pandemic, one of the uh, silver linings potentially, is parents are more aware of learning right, than they ever have been. They're more, uh, I'm sure they had the hardships of, uh, of being, you know, doing multitask and being overwhelmed and being on, on the receiving end of an impossible situation. But it's also the case that it has awakened parents to the need for education and the need for their children to be engaged in something worthwhile. I think that opportunity, and so I would, the way I would do it is first of all, I can see what that would do to engage them. And secondly, I would get parents together and school leaders and others the way that I'm sure you're doing in some of the coalition to say, OK, it, what did we learn from the pandemic that has given us ideas about how to in, in, how to involve parents uh, more productively and more effectively? I think you will find an uptake there that wasn't there before, but I think you have to be a catalyst to make it happen. Thank you very much. I'll go on to the next question because there are quite a few questions, Michael. Um, thank you, Michael, for your excellent presentation. How do you envision that community partners such as public health and other health partners that have a mandate on supporting well-being in schools are engaged in your model? Uh, well, we, we envisage it uh, because we define it that way from day one. I mean, that doesn't mean it's going to be accomplished that readily. But when we um, when we go into any of our we're into lots of communities in the 12 uh, countries, we don't go in with a learning model. We go in with a well-being learning model. When we're in Nova Scotia, sorry, in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, we are uh, the, the leadership of the of the country and of the parts of it are, are and the mental health coalition. They're part of the planning that we're talking about. They're part of the co-planning and co-development of these solutions. And so that's. Uh, uh, I would go to a near partnership uh, that coalition represents that 
but you've been in a partnership uh, where uh, you're trying to make a co cohesion out of a, of a set of silos. And that's been an uphill battle because there hasn't been enough push for those things to be connected. Uh, the big insight now, and I've said it, is that well-being and learning fused, and I want to use that word, makes a lot of sense to everybody now. They, they, it's, it's hard to accomplish, but the conditions and the propensity to want to work on it is there in a way that's never been before. So I want the uh, coalitions not just to be cooperative at the structural level, but at the, uh, and you have guidelines for yourselves for this at the local level, where the, uh, the partnerships are, this is again an extension of the newness of the parents' role. The other newness is community participation. And though it's been there and some schools have been community schools, and there's been a little bit of movement around the world that I'm aware of, and, uh, and uh, for example, in, uh, in um, UK, also in, in England, uh, and uh, sorry, the rest of uh, UK, but in, in California and in Australia. So it's been there, but now I think it can be developed with a, with a more definite integrative purpose. So it's going to require some work. It, 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 w it will require some uh, change of mind of policymakers. So that's always uh, a big problem all over Canada, which if we stick there right now, uh, we've got to see some changes that say. So I think this is the time to have professional ideas that represent solutions and political ideas that use power to get those. The more the professional ideas are are well articulated and strong, the more power you can get in the political sense. But this is a two a two two pronged uh, solution, I would say, and uh, not easy. But uh, let's not continue on trying to, you know, knock on each other's silo, and let's get some integrated solutions. Thank you, Michael. I love the idea of policy. We're always about advocating for policy, positive policies with OHSC. So thank you for that. Uh, again, another question. Just curious about where empathy fits in with your six Cs. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the six Cs, you saw just one slide, but each of them has three or four dimensions, sub-dimensions. And so, uh, you will see, we've done this analysis actually, you will see empathy uh, in several of those by name. So citizenship, about the world citizenship and the, uh, empathy is there in big ways. Uh, in uh, uh, collaboration, it's there about your, uh, your self-awareness of how you're able to relate to others as well as empathy. So uh, we did an analysis actually of the, the social emotional learning uh, framework, the SEL and found um, that that in the deep learning framework we have the six c's all of the sels were there the specifics and they were there in more than one place usually and they were embedded in the learning and the well-being so that's the way to do it if you keep adding we better have sel we better have you know uh, something else if you keep adding the pieces it never gets uh, synthesized so uh, we know it's there we we you have to do it um, you have to do it in a more sophisticated way, I guess. The way to develop empathy is not to say, we better work on empathy now. The way to develop empathy is the experience of learning and well-being is highly charged with uh, empathetic requirements and developments. And when that's part, when it comes natural, it happens a lot more deeply. It happens more in, in some ways more subtly, but more subtle and more deep mean it's there. And that people then recognize and they can articulate it. So it's a big part, but you have to get these things in a single integrated synergistic phenomenon rather than one piece at a time, which uh, will lead to never ending lists to do. Thank you very much. OK, the next question. Lawrence St. Leger think, is deeply involved in healthy schools in Australia. His research speaks to the psychosocial environment and how it is so crucial for learning in and out of the classroom. Are you involved with him in Australia? And can you please comment on this environment of psychosocial learning? Uh, let's see. Give me the name again, his name. Laurent St. Leger. Uh, I would say no, since I don't recognize the name, that I'm not involved in it. Uh, but we have uh, 
we have a strong presence in uh, Vict uh, uh, Victoria, uh, Melbourne, et cetera, and in New South Wales, Sydney, and Queensland, and uh, South Australia. So anyway, uh, we're there. And I, um, I mean, I could, I could find out, and it depends on where it is, but there is similar developments. In fact, in some ways, uh, more the, the pronounced developments along these lines that we're talking about are stronger in Australia and in Canada than they are in the US or England, if I just put it that way. And so uh, we have a lot of kindred spirits in, um, in Australia. And sometimes if they're doing a, a, social, a psychosociological model, uh, it is not tied into learning. Uh, we want to know about it. We want to relate to it to see what we can learn about it. But it's unlikely to represent the integrated model we're talking about. So, uh, but we are crossing boundaries and I'll, I'll follow it up uh, given the name you've given me. Thank you. Um, how do you suggest, and I think you talked about this, how do you suggest engaging students, and I know we have this in our board and probably other boards, that are totally disengaged, they've just dropped out of the system? Uh, well, this is, uh, we know, um, you heard me say that deep learning um, is good for all students. It's especially good for disconnected students. And uh, we have uh, a lot of examples that we are built into our case studies and that, that show that when um, you start to relate to students that, who are di as disengaged as you uh, portrayed, that if you start uh, building a relationship with them, if you start start being non-judgmental about uh, how, mu how much they're going wrong, if you start uh, asking them about what's important in their lives, what's important to their friends, if you really uh, relate to them with the strong support of a well-being support system and a uh, competency-based learning the way I'm talking about it, you will, before long, in most cases, tweak their interest, which is really their sense of purpose. And if they get engaged with some other students on a small scale into something that they've never experienced before, we have seen time and again that their peers, their teachers, their parents, anybody else who knew them said, this is a different person. So I think, uh, you know, it's certainly the case that there may be this or that case where it's impossible, uh, but there's also, because we haven't tried, there's big swaths of cases which will become uh, uh, become rejuvenated with a different approach. So this we have a we're, we pull out a lot of cases. I'm relating to quite a few people now where they send me vignettes because I'm saying, OK, you're working in a school where there's uh, the students are uh, a lot of students are alienated. They're, they're getting worse and all of that. What's happening? What are you doing? And one of the streams I have recently with a, with a group in, uh, in one of the parts of the US is that they, they said the way we treat students who are not doing well at school uh, magnifies the problem because every time they don't progress academically, we punish them again through some kind of mechanism and they get further and further behind. We have to break that cycle and get into the well being and move it into that. There are a lot of great teachers out there who know this and we need leaders, school principals who recognize this. I think uh, the Ottawa Catholic Board, because we know it's comprehensive across the 83 schools, they do a great job of this. So uh, uh, that's the way to do it is you can't, <coughs> you, you can save one child at a time to a certain point, but you have to have the, the, the system working on it so that there's a chance of it uh, actually having a critical mass and making a big difference because it will, success rubs off on each, uh, on, on each other as well as failure when it happens. So it can be done. We know what it looks like. We just have to get it to bigger scale. Thank you very much. We have three questions left or four. OK, how, how do you actually affect change in the system to be more human driven on a policy level? You mentioned there seems to be no policy on education in Ontario right now, and certainly the education system here needs a lot of change. Okay, we got any easy questions left? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so the uh, 
I mean, the answer is twofold. One is that if you're stuck with bad leadership, uh, we say, get the attitude that goes something like this. I may be stuck with the policies, but I'm not stuck with their mindset. I can have a different mindset and I am going to uh, be more influential. This is why uh, when we think of just the three levels, the local school and community level, the district or middle level and the policy level, that uh, those first two levels, if you start bubbling up combinations of this happening, which is what we're doing in deep learning, and you get you get to see it happening at a district level or multiple schools level, uh, then you 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 on the one hand you you even in Ontario I would say a lot of the things I said you're not prevented from doing by policy, it's just that policy is not helping, so you're not actually uh, legally prevented from doing it. So do more, get you get professional power and political power by doing more and pushing that. That's 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 one strand. The other strand is to change the top, and maybe when there uh, maybe there's more pronouncement now uh, because of the pandemic and the number of things. Maybe we're less tolerant of poor leadership. I'm hoping we are, uh, and I'm not talking just personally here because you can look at uh, England, you can look at Brazil, you can look at uh, uh, Russia. Uh, there's a lot of ways in which uh, uh, the human face here uh, is pretty much a lot of people, increasingly, including the young are tired of bad leadership at the center. So uh, I think there's an opportunity here, but you don't have to wait for it. You have to build up the case for it at the local and middle level and look for opportunities to push upward. And I think this decade, I go back to my moonshot, between 2021 and 2025, we can do a lot of good things on the policy level. Thank you. When you say invest in deep learning, where? Across communities at all age levels. So those are question marks. So when you say invest in deep learning, it question mark is where? Across communities, question mark, at all age levels, question mark. Yeah, we do it. Uh, we do it at all age levels. So there's, uh, uh, if we just take Ottawa, I just say it because I've, I've named it. When they started, they started with 12 schools out of 83. And the next September, they added eight more. That was 15. The third September, that's 24 months later, they added the rest, 83. They paved the way for each expansion. In other words, the next level of people became involved because they had uh, 12 months of wanting to become involved and leading towards that. So the strategy needs to be, it's, it's the whole system strategy. You can start with pieces, as they did, uh, but you uh, there's no preference to start with young versus old students, older students, I mean. Uh, you you really have to uh, uh, you wherever you start your plan must be to expand until it's a whole system phenomenon. In the case of a district, it is the whole system. And uh, as I said, you don't have to do it all at once. But the good thing is this moves fast. It's positive contagion. Once people see it working, they can't wait to want to do it because they're so used to being stuck. So there's a real incentive here. And uh, although it can't be done overnight, it doesn't take a decade. Uh, you can do a lot in uh, in two years. We've seen it, and so. But you have to have a whole system mindset, and you have to start somewhere. And already know when you're starting, we want to expand to the rest. And what you want to have, and we've done this since when we did literacy and numeracy in some uh, school districts. What you want to see is those schools who are not yet involved are saying, when can we be involved? We want to get involved. When is our turn? We want our cohort to be up. So there's a push for push for expansion that comes from uh, doing something that's attractive to others and wanting to make it easy for them to come in. So I think it's incremental, but it's an old, whole system mindset from day one. It's incremental, the pathways to get there, and the pathways are not uh, painfully slow. They are uh, fairly rapid within two or three years. Thank you very much. Students, youth, and children are change makers too. Many educators are too. I think that's why they go into this career of education. What do you say to educators who feel stuck or teachers who feel stuck, and I guess you could probably say this about EAs, ECEs, everybody else, in a system and mostly powerless to make real change happen in our schools and education system? Well, we say go to deep learning. Uh, one of our explicit uh, 
goals in deep learning. And it's a goal that came out of the findings and of the experience is students as change makers, students as uh, uh, and uh, and this is engage the world, change the world. That's what this is about. And what students as change makers, you need two ingredients, I guess I'll say. One is you need students who want to be change makers. Uh, they don't necessarily are going to come to that, you know, with, on day one, although they come to it pretty quickly uh, and they there's a, they're attracted to it, but they don't know what they don't know. So uh, both in means and in terms of what the role could be. And when you compare our, uh, we have a chart that says, here's the old pedagogy, the teacher's role, student's role. And down here uh, are the comparison to the new pedagogy and learning. There's about eight or nine things that are paired that way. And on the right hand side, which is the new pedagogy, it's a proactive role for students. So I think this goes together very well. You need two things. It's the desire to want to improve things in the world, which students actually come easily by. And it's the skill at having something to offer, which is harder to come by because that's where the learning has to be deep. So deep learning's role is to deepen the skill set of being able to make changes. And it's also part of the desire being increased. So if the skill set and the desire can feed on each other, that's what we're, I'm talking about in deep learning. Thank you very much, Michael. That is the end of our questions. And we want to thank you so much um, on behalf of the St. Clair Catholic District School Board and the Ontario Healthy Schools Coalition for your super presentation. And we look forward to getting uh, more information on those resources that you have just produced around um, engaging the disengaged. And uh, we may be um, tapping you back on the shoulder uh, for more supports and um, working with you. So thank you very, very much. Good. Thank well, you've got a great agenda. I'm so happy to, to join up with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Michael, and I want to thank Lori and Ken and Drew for their support in um, setting up this webinar and presentation and to you and Bailey for being yeah. here. And thanks, Bailey, for being the IT guy and making uh, Michael's Mac work with us. So take care, everybody, and we will be in touch and uh, have a great night. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks a lot.